Amen. Please sit down, everybody. Let's give God praise one more time, shall we, for his amazing goodness to us. Thank you to Pastor Zeke. We've got kind of like the, the gospel master in the middle and the country singers on the outside, Kendall and Laurie. Let's give it up for Kendall and Laurie for those uh, beautiful service uh, solos as well. We thank you so much. Praise God. Welcome to you. Asked that we could just start a few minutes earlier as we're starting a new series. And there's usually just a, a moment extra that I take at the start of a new series so that we can kind of say why we're doing that. But first of all, I just want to welcome you. Uh, remind ourselves that one of the most important things we do on a Sunday, of course, is to gather in worship, to gather around His Word. We bring our, our gifts. We surrender to Him. We pray that people will be saved. And then we gather in our family groups afterwards, which you know is just absolutely integral to our church. In fact, can I ask you, if you're part of a family group, group, would you put your hand in the air right now, everyone? Let's give God praise for that, shall we? And we want everyone to be part of one. And, and by the way, most of us stay. Most of us stay for family groups, usually about uh, 92% of our attendance is how many are in the family groups afterwards, and that's for all ages. And I thank God for all our children's workers that are looking after the young ones all morning, and then, of course, all the age group leaders, the student leaders, and uh, for every age, it's just so important that we can do fellowship, not just on the Sunday, but throughout the week. And we're praying for each other and texting each other, encouraging each other. So do you agree with me? That's really important, everybody. Amen. Just want to greet Northgate uh, listening this morning as well. And I know that the whole church will be interested and rejoicing that Susan Boykin was able to participate in her daughter's wedding. Uh, Don was on the dance floor as well. And so, yeah, you can hear there's encouragement from the South Campus here today. We want to bless you at Northgate as well. We praised God last week for another 12 baptisms. That's 24 in the last three weeks. And we give God all the glory and all the praise. Amen. And uh, every, every soul is precious. Every one of those uh, we want to keep praying for and encouraging them to be disciples in Jesus' name. Hey, don't we have a wonderful message, everyone? Don't we have a wonderful message of hope that Christ died for sinners? No matter what situation you find yourselves in, no matter what situation our country finds itself in right now, we thank God that Jesus is the answer for the world today. And by the way, one more thing I want to mention, that is uh, we're a meeting this afternoon about our trip to Israel next September. We've got plenty of time just to, to save up for that over the next uh, 16 months or so. So here at 4 o'clock at the South Campus, Louise and I will be there with Rich and Vicky Terry. And, uh, it's, you know, just they sit behind us every week. But Jim and Nancy came on that trip to Israel, and you were just kind of uh, not in fellowship at the time. And so uh, you sit right next to us every week. And so uh, we just get those deep relationships that come from that kind of trip. And we'd love to be able to experience that with many of you as well. So save up for that. That's really a, a life-changing experience. That, uh, it's the first time Louise was able to go as well. I know that she's, uh, she's one of the biggest fans of making a trip there. I know that Ellis is also going to mention there's been a change to our giving platform. Uh, so we just had to make that change. And so... Uh, Please make sure you're up to date with that. Of course, the, this uh, work of God is a really important work that goes on. We want to be able to keep doing all the things that God has called us to do. And so pray for our leadership team, even as we spend a, a couple of extra days on vision with all our staff this week about what God is leading us into. So we just need the hand of God. Amen. God's been good to us all this way, but we've got to keep leaning into him and saying, God, show us what you want to do next. I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Ruth as we start this new series, Family Revolution. Um, I'm going to ask you to stay with this series as much as you can. May is always a strong month for us as a church as well. Next week is communion. Uh, then, of course, we've got Mother's Day. You've got that huge graduation service. Our senior graduation was the biggest up till that point, was the largest attendance we'd ever had here at the South Campus outside uh, of Easter. And then Memorial Day was also a very strongly attended Sunday last year. I know that's really important to many of us as well. Now, the word revolution can be used in a good way or a bad way. Do you agree with me that there are some revolutions that are destructive and just take things down and what comes in is, is even worse? And then there are positive changes that bring about a good transformation. And I would say to follow Jesus is to have such a life. It was certainly a revolution for me. So I want to ask a question right now. Do I need to spell out the need for a family revolution right now. I know you're all still finding the book of Ruth, and don't worry that if you haven't got your Bible, it's going to be on the screen there. But I, I want to suggest that uh, we heard a few years ago, a number of years ago, that if there's a drop in the moral and spiritual life of the nation, especially the family life of the nation, there will be a collapse that takes place that will almost take our breath away. And I suggest to you, my friends, that we are there. And we've been there for a while. And at times it's overwhelming. 
you can't even look online for more than a few minutes if you're connected uh, without being disturbed. Rebellion, violence, new irrational social constructs and ideologies that are so contradictory and dangerous, yet you can be hated for pointing out that the emperor has no clothes. There's a spirit of lawlessness. We are suppressing our conscience. We've called good evil and evil good. Foul language is constantly on our screens if we allowed that. Hatred, greed, the inability to even have a decent conversation or face facts or even know what a fact is. There's a hatred of people groups and underneath an increase in depression and anxiety and drug dependency. And there's a huge challenge in the church family as well. In the year 2000, the median worship attendance in the USA was 137. Today, the median worship attendance in the USA is 65. Matt Carter, great pastor in America, heard him say this this week. The last 12 years have seen the biggest decline in those willing to call themselves Christian in American history. And then he said this, and it happened on our watch. It happened on my watch. All the brilliant Christian celebrities in our city, it happened on their watch too. So we're obviously not as good as we think. There's trouble all around, spiritual, moral, relational. We need a family revolution, and we need a church revolution as well, and somebody's going to say amen. And today's message, I'm calling it the four seasons of marriage, and essentially we're going to go through the book of Ruth in the order of those four particular seasons, and I think you'll agree with me when we start the reading that there's no doubt that there's something wintry about the experience of Ruth chapter one. And by the way, just about the four seasons of marriage, you might have heard me say this before, that we sometimes think that the season of marriage has to go like this. You know, it's, it starts, it's spring, it's, everything's wonderful, and then summer, the kids come along, and then it's fall, and then the, the rest of your life is kind of this rather dull winter. I suggest actually it goes a little bit more like you begin with winter. You begin with not so much. You haven't really figured each other out. You might be younger, but you don't really know what you're doing, right? That's, certainly that was our experience. <laughs> Shouldn't say that out too loud. And then, uh, then along comes spring, and then comes summer. And actually, in Georgia, don't people say that fall is the most beautiful season of all? And then it, it is fall. And it seems to me that's the pattern in the book of Ruth that we begin with something that's rather wintry. So let's invite the Word of God to speak for itself. Over the next four weeks, we'll have some fairly long readings, except chapter four, which is much shorter. And so let the Word speak for itself as this amazing story is told. May God bring application to our hearts as we go through this reading, as we see how God weaves wonderful things together and points us to the ultimate Redeemer. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem heard of that place, in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab, a foreign territory, and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah. I always want to say Oprah at that point, but it's Orpah. And the other, Ruth. After they'd lived there about 10 years, both Marlon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them and kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? 
Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's no more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. I want to pause there and say she almost makes it as hard as possible to trust in the Lord and go back to the promised land, amen? Well, certainly, we need to make sure that we don't just drag people along, but people are willing in their baptism, people are willing in their testimony. Verse 14, at this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her until they came to... Sorry, stop urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women explained, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the harvest, the barley harvest, was beginning. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So if it's winter in your life, If it's winter for the American family, with some glorious exceptions, if it's winter for the spiritual and moral and relational life of the nation, then I suggest I want to get practical right from the start. I want to suggest don't stay long in the bitterness of winter. When you're stuck in Moab, get out there as quickly as you can and go back to the house of bread. Go back to Bethlehem. The times of the judges were not great times for Israel. There were some good years, a few mini revivals, as you probably know. There were also long seasons of up to 80 years when Israel was invaded and things were a terrible mess. There were times when Israel couldn't even grow their crops without everything being looted away. The aisles were empty. This was a tough time for Naomi and her family. Her name means pleasant, but she renames herself bitter in verse 13 and 20. She lost her husband and both her boys. All the men die. I'm going to send our love to the widows this morning. We rejoice that we got a new widow's ministry. And one thing that's already a feature of our widow's ministry is that they're not not just ministering to each other and being ministered to, but they want to minister to others as well, recognizing that there are literally thousands of widows in our community. Praise God that it's possible to maintain a sweet spirit when you've gone through that great loss, but Naomi clearly was struggling with this and struggling with all of life because the bereavement of her husband and her sons meant that there was very little that she had. So why do we call this winter? I think it's fairly obvious already, first of all, the famine. In an agricultural society, there was no greater devastation than a famine, worse than recession, worse probably even than a depression, so bad that people have to leave town during those kinds of famine. And by the way, we should pray for those involved in farming today because it's going to come under attack. Uh, the, the mentality is quite mysterious and even bizarre at times, but there, there will be a tough time in, in farming. And so uh, the, first of all, the famine. Secondly, they leave the land. The man went away to Moab. Look again at verse 1. Now, if you think about this, there's a problem there. The Lord has given Israel the law of God in a land. What do we call the land? The promised land. How tragic at the beginning of this story, in the midst of that time of the judges, that covenant people were leaving the land, and Elimelech actually leads his family 
to even greater disaster. I'm going to pause there and just say, I think that's you and I sometimes. When we try to fix things, when there's a problem, and we try and fix things in a worldly way, when we try and fix it in our own way that gets off track from the Word of God, have you noticed we get into an even bigger mess as well? Everyone say amen if you agree. We've all done that many times. Sin compounds and leads to other sins. Uh, it's always the right thing to do the right thing, amen? Even when it's the hard thing to do. When society tries to twist what is right and calls it wrong and what is wrong is right, things get even worse. Have you noticed? So I think there's good pastoral application for us already, and that is don't run away from the Lord and don't run away from the things of God. Consider Jonah. He was given a tough task. I want you to go to Nineveh. And the Ninevites were a little bit like the Moabites. They were, they were kind of out of the family of God. There was a, they had a bad reputation. And Jonah didn't want to do it. So what did he do? He ran away. Went to Joppa, caught a boat, and down, down, down went Jonah. Um, I'm going to encourage you to endure in the things of God. And when the heat comes on, when the pressure comes on, that ain't no time to go to Tarshish. It ain't no time to go to Moab. It's not a time to run away or, like Lot, to be enticed by the beautiful greenery of a new area. But, of course, Lot didn't have the spiritual vision that Abraham had. Those hills and plains of the Dead Sea looked so lush, but it turned out to be a disaster. His city was incinerated. He lost most of his family and ended up living in a cave. So, in other words, if you want to end up living in a cave, run away from God and do your own thing. But it's much more important to follow the way of the Lord. We got the point already. Everyone say amen if you agree. And so Naomi's husband chose to leave the promised land. That in itself doesn't sound great. Warren Worsby says of Ruth chapter 1, Elimelech was walking by sight and not by faith. And though that may look appealing to us to go after that fleshly thing, it always ends up badly and it leads to a kind of spiritual winter. Yes, the famine had come to Israel, but we've seen in our story that God was faithful to his people. He provided for his people at the right time. And sometimes there's a famine because we've sinned. Sometimes there's a famine in our own life because that's a test. And we've had to go through that. So here's something I heard the other day. If you run away from your problems, you still take you with you. Isn't that right? The husband that goes off to try and get a software update for his marriage to get another version of that husband that goes off or the wife that goes off thinking that things will be much better second time around, be much easier, you still take you with you. And of course, it's always the other person's problem, isn't it? But you still take you with you. The immature spouse with a roaming eye, the grass is always greener, doesn't realize that very often they are the problem and the problem doesn't get solved just by dreaming of those greener pastures. Let's not run from our problems, but receive grace in the problems. And I think that's often the big temptation when you're going through a hard time, when you're toughing it out and you're being faithful and you're sticking at the job and you're sticking at family life and you're being faithful in, in your ministry. Um, I think when, when problems come, the pressure comes on and so that can often lead to a desire for escapism. I just want to find some kind of relief and release and so we go sometimes to the wrong places rather than saying, God has led me here he will provide for me. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to stay in the house of bread. Secondly, Elimelech majored on the physical instead of the spiritual. He focused so much on the physical bread that he forgot that he was leaving the house of bread, the place where Christ eventually will be born, the place where David will tend his flocks in anticipation of the coming of Christ. I want to say, Dad, let me speak to the dads today. Don't take your famine, don't take your family to Moab. Don't take your family to Moab State University, if I could put it that way. Moab was an enemy of Israel. The book of Judges ends with the men of Israel marrying Moabite women, and it all went wrong at that point. At this point, we've got the same pattern being uh, repeated in Ruth chapter 1. Elimelech's boys marry these local girls, and that was yet another step away from obedience to the family of God. You've got to stay in the promised land. You've got to marry an Israelite. Instead, they go to Moab, and they start marrying the foreign girls who, of course, were attracted to uh, other gods as well. And I want to say this, and I hear this one a lot. Well, he's a good guy. He goes to church. Um, you know, as a, we've, we've married a couple of girls off so far, and um, 
I always feel like the position that I've always wanted to be in Austin, it's great to have you back, and Alex, it's great to have all, all the sons-in-law so close by. We're so proud of you all. But I know certainly for me as a pastor and as a father, um, you imagine standing, uh, standing at the end of the aisle, and whether you're a pastor or not, you're going to walk your daughter down the aisle. Like, who is that guy at the end of the aisle? And I remember the day, all the emotions of our, our firstborn leaving home and all that, and we stood at the end of the aisle. I'm looking down at, at the, the front of the church there at the North Campus, and I can see Alex. And I'm feeling good about that. I felt good about that. And then Sarah's getting married, and I'm stood, was it on this side? Stood with Sarah on this side. I'm looking down the end of the aisle, it's like, and it's Austin. I'm feeling good about that as well. I just want to say, for your daughter, you want to feel good. And whether, whether you're the, the one getting married or you're one at the end of the aisle, you've got to make sure that you're equally yoked, that you're all following Jesus. It's like, it's not enough to say, well, he, he just comes along to church with me when I'm in town. Uh, is he sold out for Jesus? Are you equally yoked? And that was a problem uh, in Moab because there was no equal yoking. They were not under the, the covenant of God. Now, we know there's a miracle of conversion taking place in the life of Ruth, but uh, I just want to encourage us to make sure that we're equally yoked, that husband and wife are sold out for Jesus. And maybe you are married, and it's like one is more committed than the other. Can I suggest to the one who's not committed? Well, be committed. Um, your, your spouse who's more committed than you is headed in the right direction. And, and that's the kind of leadership that's required in your life. Go back to Bethlehem. Don't stay too long away from home. If you left when you shouldn't have, go back. Maybe someone's listening on the radio, watching online. Maybe you left church. You even left our church. It's time to come back. You can't turn the clock back, but you can do the right thing. And that's the story. The family get themselves into a terrible mess. Things go disastrously wrong. But this is a story of how God enables the foreigner to become a member of the spiritual family. Strangely, Ruth seems to even know more about the Lord than the natural-born Israelite. She has the uh, passion of, of the Lord God in her heart, and so she's following the Lord. And we see her leadership grow and grow through this chapter. Like our culture today, Naomi is filled with bitterness, and perhaps the Lord's going to help someone out of that today. I encourage you, bring that to the altar today. If you've got bitterness in your heart, or you're bitter about what happened to somebody else you just can't carry that for very long without, without that poisoning your spirit. We need to make sure we keep shaking off that bitterness, walking in forgiveness. Someone's going to say amen to that as well. Ruth could somehow see her bruised and broken mother-in-law. She could see that there was still a spark of faith, even though she was definitely on a downer. Her words spilling out of her were so negative, and yet Ruth knows that there was a reality behind the covenant of God. Even from Moab, she could see there was something good going on in Bethlehem. Where you go, I'll go. You will be, your God will be my God. Hey, make sure God's people, we've got to stick together. We've got to go to the house of bread. We need fellowship with each other. We're going to have communion next week. Is there any greater time than breaking, breaking bread uh, with God's people? Amen. Um, Naomi's husband led the family to Moab then. It's winter time. Why is it winter? Because of the famine, because they left the promised land, and now all the men are dead. I, I want to just pause this one as another application. Perhaps someone in your family has done something, and that's led to grief in your heart, and that's affected you. Can I just encourage you that there's hope, even though that happened to Naomi, yet God gives her a new start. When my father died, December the 28th, 1978, my mom became a widow, that affected a lot about uh, our life and our lifestyle over the next uh, number of years. Uh, but if, even though things can go wrong for us, I thank God that he took hold of me just at the right time. My spiritual revolution took place uh, in the midst of all that. And I just thank God that if you, if you find yourself with all kinds of problems all around you, you can know Jesus. You can still experience God. Your winter can become spring again. Um, I think we find it really hard to turn ourselves around sometimes. When we've gone through tough times, we're tempted just to lick our wounds for a little too long, to count our losses for a little too long. I love the way that this story does progress. They don't stay in Moab. They don't stay in winter, but hope is uh, forward here. Uh, I think one of the, the things we've, uh, we struggle with the most is to admit that we've been wrong. G give me a hand raise who loves admitting that they're wrong. 
Can I venture this? If you've not apologized to anybody in the last month, you are either walking in sinless perfection, (laughs) though I doubt it, you're either perfect or there's a lack of self-awareness of some of the clumsiness and sin and mistakes in our life that can be around us. If you've not apologized to anybody in the last month, if you've not apologized to God big time in the last month, there's a lack of self-awareness. But I tell you, my friends, when we do that, I know that, I know that when you apologize to someone, they can, they can use that, misuse that, manipulate that and all that kind of stuff. But it's, confession is good for the soul. And it's a good thing sometimes to fall on your sword and say, I'm sorry. That happened on my watch. I'm sorry I said that. You know, the the non-justifying apology is the best one, right? Uh, I'm sorry, but you were so-and-so and so-and-so. That doesn't work, does it? Just, I'm sorry. You you might want to explain it later, but not excuse it. But there's something that, I I don't know, Elimelech didn't go back. The, the, The young men were staying in Moab. It was almost desperation and a report in verse 6. Look at this. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people. Now, God was always going to come to the aid of his people. So don't leave, Mo- don't leave the house of bread and go to Moab. Stay through the hard times. They didn't. They messed up. Family's a disaster. And there's something good taking place, though. She and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Don't stay long in the bitterness of winter. Secondly, endure until spring. And to endure, that can sometimes mean to go back the way you came, to get things right again, to apologize to God, to apologize to your spouse, apologize to your friend, apologize to your colleague. They they may not rise up and say hallelujah when you apologize, but you know something? You're ministering now, you're living now out of a restored heart. I had an incredible conference. I was away with Louise for three days, and uh, we listened to Paul Tripp, uh, spoke to us, who's incredible, Jim Malado, who's uh, the head of Compassion, and essentially the message that we were, were receiving as a group of pastors, and I, I'm going to tell you, when we used to go away with pastors, very similar kind of churches to ourselves, there's about 50 of us that have been meeting now for, for many, many years, I would say probably 10 years ago, if there was a temptation in the group, it would be towards pride, being a little pompous. Comparing our numbers, all that kind of thing. Now, the game, the game has totally changed. Now it's like weakness. In fact, we even joked like three years ago. Well, this was my joke anyway. I said, we can't call this mega metro anymore. We all lost like 80% of our churches in 2020. I said, Look, we're going to call ourselves mini metro from now on. I said, it's really good for our humility uh, to do that. Now, of course, God's been gracious to all our churches, and he's doing some amazing things, amazing things in our church. But isn't it a good th- thing to be humble, Right? To be reliant upon God. And let me tell you, when you minister out of a restored heart, isn't that a beautiful thing? Every time we minister and it's not out of a restored heart, 1 Corinthians 13 says, if we don't have love, we're not ministering out of a restored heart, it's a disaster, amen? And so don't underestimate getting a restored heart here today in Jesus, amen? And so verse 7, she sets out on the road, Back to the land of Judah. I'm going to say endure until spring. She's on the road again. She's going back to Bethlehem. Naomi and Ruth are traveling from the far side of the Dead Sea on the east of Israel. Somehow, we don't know whether it was under the Red Sea or, or sorry, under the Dead Sea or over the Dead Sea, but they're going back towards Bethlehem, which is kind of a little higher than the Dead Sea. Naomi and Ruth are traveling back. You've you got to go back in the right direction, amen. Go back to the house of bread. If it's winter in America today, if it's winter in your home, in your spiritual life, if we've had winter in our churches in America in recent years, I tell you what, friends, we have a family revolution, we have a spiritual revolution when we turn our hearts back to our true spiritual Bethlehem, when we turn our hearts back towards home. There's no hope with the gods of Moab. Elimelech and Naomi Left, to, left the promised land to better themselves, and now their dreams have turned to ashes. And maybe you're feeling like that today. Maybe there's someone feeling like that. It's your job. It's your money. It's a relationship 
Someone said things to you that have hurt you and wounded you. There's a child walking away from the faith, a proposal that just isn't happening. There's a toxic person in your life, a report of what could happen, and you're worried about it. What do we do in that situation? Let me tell you, you turn your heart towards home. You turn your heart back towards the house of bread, and you start walking. And even though Naomi perhaps carries that gait of a broken-hearted widow, nonetheless, she heads out towards Bethlehem, and she keeps going. Do you remember the shepherds? Let's hurry to Bethlehem. And so this special family, now two, they used to be more of them, Ruth and Naomi, turn their heads towards home and they persevere and they keep going on this long and even dangerous journey. We've got to get out of Moab, right? I'm just going to ask, maybe there's someone here today and there's something of Moab in your life. Uh, I suggest to you that during the pandemic, We didn't have to go to Moab, but Moab came to us, especially online, as our world almost came completely online for a few weeks. It's like Moab came to the world. Let me tell you, you know this, young people, so many uh, satanic ideas came into the hearts of young people, not just young people, but all ages as well. Moab and the gods of Moab got their claws into so many people, and they haven't let go, amen? Amen. I praise God for the youth revival that we've experienced here at the South Campus when, do you remember Alex, during that summertime, you all started meeting outside and even when it got really cold, you stayed outside, you didn't have all the lights and the smoke, just the guitars and the young people started leading the worship and we've experienced a youth revival and we we praise God for that, but do you agree with me that Satan's deceptions are cruel? He's a roaring lion who tears at human flesh and fragile minds. And so during these last three years, in this desperate decline of the church in our nation. It's been heartbreaking how many have been dragged away from the faith. Many have stopped believing in Jesus. Many have stopped believing in the church. Uh, the racial tension in America, it's real because you know what? There's a whole bunch of people that don't want to wor- worship alongside people of the same color as themselves. I know, that's real and it's terrible. Say amen if you agree that's a terrible thing. Absolutely heartbreaking, but you know what the devil is trying to do? He's trying to divide us from from God. He's trying to divide us from one another as well. But we praise God for the church of Jesus Christ. The gods of Moab will keep you in winter. There must have been everything within Naomi and Ruth. In fact, it's almost a battle going on when she says, well, you can stay if you want. You can stay if you want. It's almost like she's saying, well, I wonder if I could stay as well. But she knows where the house of bread is. She knows where Bethlehem is. She doesn't even realize that something is stirring in her soul that is about the redemption of the world. There's a preparation for the coming of Christ. This is the preservation of the very line of Jesus Christ occurring in this conversation at, at, the, at the, uh, the city gates of Moab as they're leaving. Maybe there's someone even still here. You're at the gates of Moab. It's like, can I give up that relationship? Can I really give my life to Christ? Can I really obey the word of God? Can I really tithe? Can I really go to church every week, be sold out for Jesus? Can I really tell my friends, you're at the gates of Moab. I'm gonna encourage you. Keep moving away from Moab and move towards the house of bread, amen? Amen. That's true for every single one of us today. Maybe a young person here today and your parents have been counseling you away from drugs, away from a false view of sexuality, I suggest your parents are on the right track. Come away from Moab and go to the house of bread. Maybe there's a student here. You've been warning your parents away from the drinks cabinet because you know they're drinking too much. You know it dominates their life too much. There may be just one or two people here, maybe even more. Apparently 10% of the nation have got to struggle with, with this right now. Maybe that's your Moab and you've got to move away from Moab and say, hey, that's, that's going to play no part in my life anymore. But they, they progress. And now we see this holy conversation taking place between Ruth, the Moabite, who's learning about covenant relationship from a backslidden Israelite. Ruth speaks some of the greatest words ever spoken in Scripture. This is her confession of faith. Let's look at it again at verse 16. This is a high point in Scripture. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Oh, I know there's a battle going on for my soul. There's a battle going on in America. There's a battle going on in your family. But where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. 
Your people will be my people and your God, my God. The land of the covenant is now Ruth's land. This is the strongest statement of faith in this winter life experience. But Aslan is on the move. Or rather, Naomi and Ruth take another step forward. They're moving away from Moab. They're going towards the house of bread. I know this is for someone here today. Maybe for many people, you've got to move away from Moab and get to the house of bread in your own heart today. The last thing I want to say is that Christ turns our winter into spring. It's really important for us to see Jesus in this whole story. We'll see it more and more as we come and meet Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and we'll try and understand what that means for us today. But I see them now. They've gone on this journey. Might have taken a few weeks. Dangerous terrain, uh, a difficult environment. Uh, It's a time of famine. Uh, And so there's scarcity on that journey. I don't know how much they were carrying or whether they had enough money to buy stuff on the way, but they were probably pretty hungry, I would imagine. And now they're getting near to Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. It's probably even smaller then, wasn't it? House of bread. And how do you feel when you get close to Bethlehem? When you've left the promised land, perhaps feeling good, I'm going to leave my people behind. I'm, we're going off to Bethlehem. We're immigrating. We've got our visas. We're off to Moab. And now you're Naomi. You come back to town. Your husband's gone. And in that culture, that meant your status had gone. It meant that, that the rights that you had to the land that was yours in possession, that's gone. You don't have your sons to be the heirs of that either. And so therefore, the young lady with you, she doesn't stand to inherit anything either. And that's a big background for next week. I'll talk about that. You're coming back to the house of bread. You're back to God's town. In in a few generations, David is going to keep sheep there. And many generations after that, angels are going to sing in the sky there. But you're back to Bethlehem. And what do the people say? Can this be Naomi? I mean, look at her. She was so full of life. She was married. Her future was ahead of her. They left us behind. And I wonder whether she may have felt pretty embarrassed about that whole thing. She may have known that she didn't look anything like she used to look. In fact, when you're living in bitterness, doesn't that start to affect your physical appearance, everybody? Uh, Apparently, Abraham Lincoln um, once refused to to have a particular man in his cabinet. And somebody asked, why why didn't you, you, um, why didn't you have him in your cabinet? And Lincoln said, I didn't like his face. And he said, well, you can't say that. What do you mean he didn't like his face? He's not responsible for his face. Then Lincoln said, every man over the age of 40 is responsible for his face. It's interesting, isn't it? Bitterness can do that to us. Kind of unforgiveness can do that to us. Living in Moab will do that to you. You can usually tell, as a pastor, I'm going to be, I'm going to dare to be so bold as to say, speaking to the same crowd every week for a long, long time, you can kind of usually see if something's going on. You're all being really nice and attentive right now, but you can usually, you can usually see it in someone, can't you? There are little signs in their life. So Naomi arrives back in Bethlehem. Can this be Naomi? Maybe someone being a little pharisaical about that. You're like, oh, we're here and we got the bread. Now she's only coming back because we got bread and the Lord's come to our aid. We can be judgmental. Sometimes we can even gawp at those who've fallen on hard times. Do you agree with me? That's a sin that we've probably all committed at some stage. When someone falls or hurts, it's so easy to become the finger pointing Pharisee. And so well done, Naomi. You got Ruth with you. You got this mini community of faith. Maybe you're having Bible studies on the road to Bethlehem. Here we are at the gates. Can this be Naomi? Can you feel the pain of all that? But aren't you proud of Naomi and Ruth? Aren't you thrilled at what they're doing? And they're going to walk into such unexpected, miraculous, and marvelous blessing. You got to stay with this story because if you stay in winter, you're going to leave this series feeling really depressed. But there's hope, isn't there? We sang about that today. I wonder whether, one thing I've noticed is that if someone leaves church, they almost never come back in these parts. 
And I wonder why that is sometimes. Maybe it's because a good repentance and a good renewal and going back to Bethlehem is a really hard thing to do. Maybe we sometimes imagine in our minds that people are thinking all kinds of things that they're not necessarily thinking at all. Can I just say, it doesn't matter. Uh, Come to the altar. Come to the house of bread. Turn to the Lord. That's always the right thing to do. And if maybe someone's watching online, uh, you're listening on the radio, and you've left a church or even this church, I encourage you, come back. We won't ask you where you've been. Amen, church? We'll just be really glad to see you. And there are still people that have been kept away from church, actually not just three years, but some for four years and five years. We need to make sure we find Naomi and bring her along to our church as well. So Naomi meant pleasant, now she's bitter, but we're gonna see that things will change. The last verse, Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. The barley harvest comes in spring in Israel, Just like it's spring right now, winter has passed. And I want to encourage you, friends, that with Jesus, any day you come to Jesus, your winter will become spring. I'm not saying that your circumstances will change. Sometimes it's God's plan for us just to endure through the circumstances. Sometimes we even have to endure through the circumstances of our own making as well. Some of the mistakes that we made ourselves, sometimes we just have to be patient about that and work it through. Better way, guys. Thank God that you're here in the house of bread today. We bless you and encourage you. But we want you to know, and I I don't know that you know this, but we want you to know that we're all on that same journey from Moab to Bethlehem. The miracle is that we don't reach up to God ourselves, but Christ has reached down to us. We praise God that the babe was born in Bethlehem. And when the shepherds knew about this, they hurried to Bethlehem. And I would say faith is just hurrying to Bethlehem. Faith is turning your heart towards the Lord and thanking God for what he has done. It's not about what we can do. It's about what Christ has done for us on the cross. And so this story finishes really well. But to anyone who follows Jesus here today, you know that you've been through tough times as well in your following of Jesus. Uh, I have to say that for me, 2020 was pretty wintry. And even the last days of 2020 was like, I cannot wait for 2021. And the joke, of course, was after 2020 came 2021, and that was even even worse, because we started to get all the effects of uh, just being shut down from each other and all the massive collateral damage that we're still walking through today. Um, but I thank God that joy comes in the morning, amen? And there were times when we would just, Jimmy, we'd put out like, How many chairs did we put out originally? A couple of hundred chairs or something like that. 400 chairs. And and then we put 500 chairs. And then we were getting crowned. We went to two services. Then we blasted out into this setting here as well. And I just thank God the joy comes in the morning. Amen. I thank God for each and every one of you. I love this church. We love this church. Praise God for what he's doing in our midst. But I'll tell you what. Those days will still come. And your stomach will churn some days. And Satan will attack And then one of his people does something really unspiritual, out out of step with the Spirit. And someone else doesn't follow through. And somebody ghosts you. And someone steps out of covenant fellowship. And a Christian worker follows the flesh and goes after the lush valley of Lot. But I tell you what, in the midst of all that, we don't run away. We go to the house of bread. And if you're in the house of bread, isn't that a precious place to be? Jesus is the bread of life. And we thank you, Jesus, for your presence here today. So to anyone going through tough times, anyone who's in winter right now, even a nuclear winter in your own life, can we praise God for this story? Let's give God praise for this story, shall we? I'm going to ask us to stand together. And let's pray for the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts right now. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, It feels sometimes like winter in America. Winter for the family, winter spiritually, morally, relationally. Our hearts are breaking and sometimes, Lord, we're angry at what we see all around us and sometimes we're even angry at what we see in ourselves. The marriage is frosty, the children don't listen, the addiction dominates, revival seems far away. 
But we thank you, Lord, that you worked in Naomi's heart, though she was almost reluctant at first. And you worked in Ruth's heart. And you worked a miracle. Sovereignly, you brought things together in that special little town. A few generations later, there will, there will be David, a special king who wrote the Psalms, prepared the way for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, for anyone who's in winter today, I pray that spring will come by turning our hearts towards you and saying, yes, Lord. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin, and then he rose again. We thank you, Jesus, for the new covenant in Christ. And as we meet together next week, we pray for a powerful sense of your presence with your people. Father, help us to not stay long in the bitterness of winter. Help us to endure till spring comes. We thank you that you turn our winter into spring. So I wonder if there's someone here today, and it could be many of us. We just need to journey away from Moab. And when I mention Moab, there's just something in your life that's like, yeah, I need some victory in that part of my life. I'm going to encourage you. Would you come forward with me? We're going to pray in a minute. We're going to have a song uh, in, in a couple of minutes. But would you come forward as, as the music starts, as we begin this song, and just say, you know what? Lord, give me victory. Maybe there's someone that you know who's in Moab, and you're just burdened for them, and that's been your heartache. You just pray. Pray them back into the house of bread. Would you even come and pray for a spiritual, moral, and relational revolution in this nation? for the things of God to be esteemed in a way that they are not right now. In other words, I'm calling upon us to come and pray for revival in this place. It's time for some invitational music now. Let's just come forward, shall we, as uh, Brother Jared leads us in our singing.